All right, we have a lot to do today, so you're going to want to really pay your best attention if you can. And uh, maybe, because we're going to go through a lot of ideas, maybe you can rewatch the video, um, if, at least certain parts of it, if you feel like you didn't quite get it. By the way, real quick, I did reset the clock that's up there, so now at least it's pretty, pretty close to the right time, just in case you look up there a lot. Lecture A. We're going to continue what we were doing at the end of Lecture B last time. I am going to switch it up a little bit and talk about bigger ideas here in Lecture A. And then Lecture B is going to be a little bit more calculation focused. Introduce something called parametric curves, uh, which actually in the book goes back to Chapter 4. Uh, do some trigonometric integrals and use a table of integrals in mathematics and compare what kinds of answers that we get. All right, so let's start with that example that we were looking at at the end of class last time. Where I had a velocity function. So this axis was velocity, and this, this axis was time. I'll take time to be in the standard units of seconds and velocity in meters per second. And the graph I made was a piecewise function. Okay, So it was... Uh, it was actually piecewise linear. I took it to be negative 2 when t was from 0 to 4, I believe. And if it wasn't 0 to 4, then this is the example I'm going to do today. Going up to 5, going up to 0, excuse me, when t is 5, and continuing all along a straight line after that. So I'm pretending that's my velocity, and my goal is to find my displacement, my change in position. Displacement means change in position. Not position itself necessarily, <coughs> unless you start at position zero. You know, whatever, you, you make a number line, I'm going to walk back and forth here. If I say, like, a line with this table here is position zero, I could start at position zero and walk back and forth. And then change in displacement, uh, change in position, displacement would be the same as my actual position itself. So I say that direction is positive, that direction over there is negative. I'm starting out at time zero with a negative two meters per second velocity. So actually, I got to get a running start. I am to the, to the uh, right of my uh, position zero when time is negative, so to speak. I start walking at two meters per second that way in the negative direction. At time zero, I'm at position zero, so I just pretend I'm walking at two meters per second. I walk that way for four seconds. I'm probably going to run into the wall over there. Okay, pretend I do it for four seconds. As I get close to, uh, to five seconds, between four and five seconds, my velocity becomes closer to zero. The velocity in the negative direction of two meters per second gets closer to zero. I'm slowing down. When time is five seconds, I turn around at that instant in time and start speeding up the other way because the velocity uh, becomes positive and is increasing. So I'm moving the other direction and, and constantly increasing my speed in that direction. That is the velocity. Um, the speed is the absolute value of the velocity. You could draw a speed graph on here as well. I think I'll make a dash because I'm not going to focus on that. The speed is the absolute value of the velocity, which would look about like that. That would be the absolute value of the velocity graph. I'm focused on velocity. That's how the direction all right, what do I want to do? I want to find my distance traveled function, or excuse me, my displacement function. D of t is going to be the displacement change in position from time 0 to time t. That black mark doesn't work so hot. All right, I'm trying to keep track of the point that looks better. Hopefully this does. Okay, displacement up to time t. Can I find a formula for this is the idea? In an abstract sense, I haven't shown you what I'm about to show you before, I can always write a formula for this in terms of an integral. To this point, I have mostly written <coughs> indefinite integrals for this kind of thing, antiderivatives. I'm not going to write a definite integral, but I'm going to put a, um, the variable t as the upper limit of the integration. Like this. 
Now, you should have read about this, actually, if you're up to date on your reading and studying for the mini-exam mini next Monday. I've got to write the test today. Okay. Reviewing chapters 5 and 6, those problems at the end of the chapters. Again, I'm making problems similar to a sampling of those, just changing the numbers. You've read about this. It's section 6.4. The title of that section is the, they say, the second fundamental theorem of calculus. Actually, some people don't make a distinction between a first and second fundamental theorem of calculus. They just say the fundamental theorem of calculus. Though, the fundamental theorem of calculus can be thought of, thought of in various ways. And the way it's thought of here is something called the antiderivative construction form is the way I want to think about it right now. It's probably the hardest way to think about it. By doing the integral from 0 to t of the velocity function, I am constructing an antiderivative of the velocity function. I am creating an antiderivative of the velocity function. This is going to be a function of t where t is that upper limit. The upper limit is a variable. It's kind of strange for you. But it's an important perspective to be able to deal with. Should I put a v of t dt in here? Well, physics professors often do. They don't worry about it. But I want to emphasize that the true variable for this function is the upper limit of the integral. So I'm going to use a different letter. Why don't I I'll use the Greek version of t? Let's call it, let's use tau. v of tau d tau. So tau kind of looks like a fancy t. It's a Greek letter. The question is now, how do you actually find this? You could find a piecewise formula for the velocity and sort of integrate each piece in such a way to make the final formula continuous, make the graph match up, especially worrying about perhaps t equals 4, to make it match up right. But I'm going to do something different. I'm going to emphasize the signed area interpretation of the definite integral to help me figure out a formula. I'm initially going to think about it in three cases, actually. T is between 0 and 4. T is between 4 and 5. And T is bigger than 5. 5 is less than T. Though, in the end, we'll see that I actually only need to worry about two cases, because I'll get the same formula for two of these. Don't answer out loud, but maybe you can guess which two of these will produce the same formula. I want to think about it in terms of sine area. So first, the, 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 uh, what's the word? pretend. Pretend t is between 0 and 4, like there. The integral, we know, when the graph is below the axis, is going to give us the area above the graph and below the axis with a negative sign in front. What is the area here? It's a rectangle even though it kind of looks like a square. What's the base of the rectangle? Although I'm drawing it at the, at the top there. It's that length, it's t. What's the height? The height is not negative 2, it's positive 2. Though the integral will be negative. I want to emphasize the height of this rectangle as a positive quantity. It's positive 2. The area of this rectangle then, base times height, is 2t. But yeah, now the graph is below the axis, so now put a negative sign in front of it. Negative 2t. Not too hard to guess, actually, if you think about the fact that the formula for this function between 0 and 4 is negative 2. Integrate negative 2, you get negative 2t. Plus c. C is going to be 0 because we are taking D of 0 to be 0. And that matches the fact that if you plug in the T equals 0 up there, you'd be integrating from 0 to 0, which has got to be 0. There's no area to deal with when you go from 0 to 0. It's a little trickier in the next case. Now let's pretend t is between 4 and 5. Maybe if you're taking notes, you might want to redraw the picture quick. I'm going to pretend t is between 4 and 5. <coughs> Graph is still below the axis, so the integral is still going to be the opposite, the negative of that area. 
That is a, uh, a rectangle and a trapezoid. The area of the rectangle is 2 times 4, 8. What's the area of the trapezoid? The area of the trapezoid can be found as, in this case, the base times the average of the heights. The base is right here, that little line segment, its length. Think about that carefully. What's the length of that line segment in terms of t? T minus 4, yeah. The height of this side of the trapezoid is 2. The height of this side of the trapezoid is trickier. The value of v at this value of t is negative. Technically, the height is the opposite of that. Technically, I could write the height as negative v of t. But what is v of t there? We need a formula for that line. It's not too hard. Uh, I hope you can see that the slope of that line is 2. Rise over run here. From here to here is 2 for the rise, 1 for the run. 2 over 1 is 2. It also goes through 0 when t is 5. The formula for v of t here in this part of the graph draw an arrow just on this part of the graph, v of t is 2 times, in parentheses, t minus 5. Or if you prefer, 2t minus 10. So the height of this is actually negative 2t plus 10. That's actually a positive quantity when t is less than 5. Like t is 4, for example. 2. That thing is a positive quantity when t is less than 5. Bear with me here. Again, the area of the rectangle is 8, and I need a negative sign in front of it because the graph's below the axis. And then minus, because the graph's below the axis, the area of this trapezoid, this is tricky, area of this trapezoid, uh, base t minus 4 times the average of the heights, 2 plus, bring the room, Two plus what's the other height? Again, that's a positive quantity. That's the quantity I need, negative 2t plus 10. The fact that the graph is below the axis, um, again, means this is a positive quantity, but the integral is going to be negative, so I need a minus sign there. Are you going to have to do a problem like this? Not on the mini exam, but maybe on exam one. Probably give you help. This is very tricky. Very easy to get confused, very easy to make a mistake. In fact, I hope I did not make a mistake. Again, there's the base. Adding up the two heights and dividing by two is the average of the heights. The subtraction there is because the graph is below the axis, so the integral <coughs> over that part is negative. This quantity right here should be a positive quantity, and that's to the right of the negative sign. Let's simplify this thing. Running out of board space, let me just simplify this part up here. Um, this becomes negative 2t plus 12. Divide that by 2. I get negative t plus 6, it looks like. That becomes negative 2t plus 12. Divide everything by 2, it gets negative t plus 6. Keep, keep simplifying. Being very careful not to make a mistake with minus signs, and I hope I'm not making a mistake. Distribute the minus sign through there, get t squared minus uh, 10t ultimately, it looks like. <coughs> plus 24 minus 8 is plus 16. That looks like that's what this formula simplifies to. Is the derivative of that equal to this? It is. That's good. It's not a proof that it's the answer. 
because the derivative of 16 is 0. Like, how do you know that 16 is right? Do these graphs match up? Uh, this, do these functions, this one and this one, match up at t equals 4 at the boundary? That's negative 8 when t is 4. This better be negative 8 when t is 4 as well. 4 squared is 16, minus 40. So what, negative 24 plus 16 is negative 8. Matches up. This is the right answer. I feel good. Finally, when t is bigger than 5, or 5 is less than t, now we draw the picture again. Now t is over here to the right of 5. The integral is going to be that area minus that area. That whole thing is a trapezoid, or if you prefer, a rectangle and a triangle. What's its area? The area of that rectangle is A. What's the area of this triangle? One half base times height. The base is one, the height is two. One half <coughs> times one times two is one. The area of that triangle is one. The integral from zero to five is going to be negative nine. Negative eight minus one. So I get a negative nine. I want to add the area of that triangle plus one half base times height. What's the base of this triangle? It's t minus five. Reason in enough not to see those small letters there. Okay. The base is t minus five. What's the height? It's v of t. Now v of t is a positive quantity when t is bigger than five. I don't need that negative sign there. This was a positive quantity when t was less than five. V of t itself is a positive quantity when t is bigger than 5. Very tricky. That's what we need there. Let me bring the two, two fact, factor back out, actually, because then I'm going to cancel it with the 1 half. When this is simplified, I bet, if I made a mistake, I bet I get the same. Negative 9 squared t minus 5. T squared minus 25, uh, minus 10t, excuse me, minus 10t plus 25t squared minus 10t plus 16. How about that? Same thing. T squared minus 10t plus 16 in both spots, in both cases. So in reality, we only needed two pieces to this formula. T is less than or equal to 4, and T is bigger than 4. What am I doing here? Okay? I'm emphasizing some things. I'm emphasizing, well, ultimately the fact that the displacement is going to give us, or the integral of the velocity is going to give us the displacement, and we're going to graph that displacement function and see what it looks like. I'm emphasizing that you can think of this as a definite integral, and that we can evaluate that definite integral by thinking about the signed area interpretation of the integral. Uh, when I say signed, I mean that kind of sign, plus or minus. Areas below the graph when it's above the axis are counted positively, and areas above the graph and below the axis are counted negatively, is what I mean, signed area. Thinking about these cases, thinking about signed areas, I can find a formula for the same derivative. I can see that the algebra works out almost amazingly to give you the right answer, it seems. Um, so I'm, I'm emphasizing those things. And I'm also emphasizing one more thing, this second fundamental theorem of calculus, this antiderivative construction theorem. We have created, by using a definite integral, an antiderivative <coughs> called the red graph here. The derivative of capital D is little v for all t. We have constructed an antiderivative of the velocity. And it does represent displacement. What does its graph look like? Uh, I'm not going to take the time to draw in Mathematica. Looking at these formulas here, the negative 2t and this one, I know that when t goes from 0 um, to 
0, 4, the graph is about like this. It goes down to negative 8. I'm now graphing the displacement, which if I start at the origin at time 0 is the same as my position. So my position goes to negative 8 before it starts going, um, starts not being nonlinear. If you graph this function, you should get a graph that looks about like this. And ultimately it's going to be positive. Uh, you factor that easily or not. It's ultimately going to be positive once t gets past. Um, to factor it, wouldn't it be just t minus 8, t minus 2? Uh, they wouldn't multiply to give you 16 though, at the end there. Wait, but a negative 8 and a negative 2? Negative 8, negative 2, okay. I thought you said 18. Oh. <laughs> yeah, let's see, that factors as t minus 2 times t minus 8. That's correct. So it does come back up to 0 when t is 8. Thanks for seeing that. Something about like this, it's got a minimum at t equals 5. That's what the bridge It's a, It's not a parabola overall. It's a straight line here, and once you get to that point, then it's a parabola. That's the position as a function of time. There, the position, yes, um, if you start at position zero, at time zero. So it's going to take me eight seconds to get back to where I started, but then after that point, then I keep moving to the right, faster and faster. All right. Do another application of this. Say we wanted to find this this indefinite interval. Maybe because it's a velocity. It's going to say equals question mark at the moment. I'd like to get a little bit more practice with the signed area interpretation, although in this case it's going to be a true area interpretation of the integral. The graph of y equals one, a square root of 1 minus t squared looks like this. It's the upper half of the unit circle. Based on what I just told you, if I do a definite integral of this function from 0 to some upper limit, some variable upper limit, it will create an antiderivative of this function. Now I can try to guess an antiderivative just by doing a lot of guessing, or actually there's something called trigonometric substitution, which we'll learn about next week or the week after, that can help us do this. But I want to reemphasize the sine area interpretation again. Oh, maybe I should have used an x here. Let me use a big T here. Let's pretend big T is a positive number. The integral from 0 to big T of this function, square root of 1 minus little t squared, thought of as a function of big T, capital T, by what I just told you, should be an antiderivative of this function with a capital T in place of a little t. I'll say that again. By what I just told you with the last example, if I integrate this from, for example, 0 to some variable upper limit, which I'm calling big T here, I will create a new function of capital T that I'm claiming will be an antiderivative of this function, the integrand, with a capital T instead of a little t. Capital T is going to be my variable here. Maybe you should have used an X to start with and made that a little T, but oh well, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. uh, that's only true because the lower limit is zero, right? If no, you can use other lower limits, actually. And, it, and it'll still be? It'll still be an antiderivative. Um, zero is just kind of the nice one to use here. Okay. You'll get different antiderivatives that'll be vertical translations to each other. I want to again emphasize the sign inter area interpretation of the integral, though in this case it's just the area interpretation because the graph is above the axis. What is the area of this thing? Kind of looks like a trapezoid, but careful, it's a circle. It's an arc of a circle out there. It's not a trapezoid. 
We can break it into a triangle and a piece of pie, however. Like that. We know the formula for the area of a triangle, 1 half base times height. What's the formula for a piece of pie like this? Well, you know the area of an entire circle is pi r squared, or in this case, pi, because the radius is 1. If I knew this angle in radians, let's call it theta. Um, it's going to turn out that it'll be the area will be one half theta, because if theta were two pi, one half times two pi is pi. I get the area of the entire circle. So with the radius being one, which it is here, the area of that set of that um, piece of pi here with that angle in radians is one half. Theta you do have to deal with the radius if it's other than one. Try to keep it simple here. So, what I want to do here is get the area of the triangle and the piece of pi in terms of capital T. And I'll be done. Done give me an anti -rhythm. Area of the triangle is easier. One half base times height. The base is capital T. What's the height? Well, the length of this line segment, which I can get by plugging capital T into this function. Inflation blue. Square root of 1 minus capital T squared. There's the area of the triangle. Not done, I gotta add the area of the piece of pi. The sector of the circle is the official name. Looks like a piece of pi. I said it was one half times the angle, one half theta, but what is theta in terms of x? Use a little geometry here. Um, the y-axis and this blue line there are parallel lines. I've got a line crossing those parallel lines. Hopefully you remember from geometry that alternate interior angles are congruent. This angle is theta, and that's theta too. And that's good because that's a right triangle in there. I can now use trigonometry to figure out how theta depends on x. In fact, probably the simplest thing to do since this is the unit circle is to use the Sine function, sine of theta uh, is opposite of our hypotenuse, capital T over 1. Sine of theta is capital T, therefore theta is arc sine of capital T. Or inverse sine. This is arc sine of capital T. If I could not make a mistake in my thinking. Sine of that angle, looking at this right triangle right there, zoom in on that. Sine of that angle up there is opposite over hypotenuse, so katoa, so sine is opposite over hypotenuse. Opposite side is capital T, hypotenuse is 1, it's the unit circle here. Sine of that angle is capital T, therefore the angle is arc sine of capital T. That would be an antiderivative of that function, the derivative of this thing with arc sine of t in place of theta, d d capital T should be square root of 1 minus capital T squared. Is it? Mathematica. Will you check it for us? It's almost quiz time to hang on. Uh, you can do derivatives on Mathematica with a capital D. Whoops. Thanks. My input. Yes, okay, I'm in input mode. Capital D does derivatives. Maybe I better make sure I'm in input mode. Okay, there we go. Yep, we're in input mode. Capital D, if I differentiate this function of capital T, again with an arc sine of t in place of theta, what do I get? The function is 1 half t times square root of 1 minus t squared plus arc sine t over 2. Differentiate that with respect to capital T. It may not look right at first. It doesn't. But maybe I can simplify that. 
What was that? Hey, look, it simplifies the right thing. Doing this kind of thing really does give you antiderivatives. That's section 6.4. It's supposed to be a review, but you may have forgotten it. You are responsible for this kind of idea on the mini test next month. Talk a little bit about, about it more uh, after the quiz, and then do some other stuff.